and welcome to another evening of Frank Conversation here on Hard Copy, coming to you from our studios in Abuja. I'm Maupe Ogun Yusuf. Like a boat out of the blue, Nigerians woke up to news, which has since been dismissed as untrue, that the salaries of public service holders were about to be increased by a whopping 114%. The government agency which has responsibility for this is the Revenue Mobilization and Fiscal Allocation Commission, RAMFAC. The story had emanated from the news agency of Nigeria, NAN. According to NAN, the RAMFAC chairman, Mohamed Dushehu, was represented by Federal Commissioner Rekia Tanko Ayuba, who spoke at the presentation of reports of the reviewed remuneration package to Kebbi State Governor Dr. Nasir Idris on Tuesday in Burning Kebbi. In the speech she gave while representing the chairman, she said, 16 years after the last review, it is imperative that the remuneration packages for the categories of the office holders mentioned in the relevant sections of the 1999 Constitution as amended should be reviewed. It was as a result of this continuing process that the federal commissioner had visited Kebbi State. When the matter was reported in the press and received a huge backlash, the spokesperson of the commission, Mr. Christian Wanchuku, was quoted as saying, not my chairman, not my chairman. My chairman has never made any statement on it, and I have not made any statement on it. No statement from the chairman, no statement from me. So I don't know. I heard one of the commissioners said it. I don't want to be quoted. No approval yet. There is no approval yet. Everything is under the process. It has to come as a bill for Mr. President to assent. Well, the presidential spokesperson, Mr. Dili Alake, also reiterated this point in a statement he later released. In his words... We state without any equivocation that President Bola Tinubu has not approved any salary increase and no such proposal has been brought before him for consideration. While we recognize that it is within the constitutional remit of the Revenue Mobilization, Allocation and Fiscal Commission to propose and fix salaries and allowances of political office holders and judicial officers, such cannot come to effect until it has equally been considered and approved by the president. The backlash that has greeted this review is not unexpected, given that Nigerians are currently feeling the pinch from the removal of petrol subsidies and a float of the Naira, which has significantly impacted the cost of leaving. It brings to the fore questions around the sacrifice which Nigerians expect their elected public office holders to make even as they ask the electorate to make sacrifices themselves. And it also brings to the fore the question of balance, because also caught in the melee are judicial office holders whose salaries might not be increased as a result of the seeming insensitivity to the times displayed by Ramfak. On Hard Copy tonight, I speak with an analyst who had nursed very strong reservations in the removal of subsidy and its effect on the masses. We'll be speaking on the cost of governance and the expectations of Nigerians. Majita Hero, welcome to Hard Copy. Thank you very much. Well, I say your worst fears, I don't know if they're your worst fears though, but your, some of your fears have come to pass. Yes. Subsidy has been taken away, subsidies on petrol, and um, also the Naira has been floated. Yes. A double whammy of some sorts. Are you still on edge about the effects of this? Yes, and I think a lot of other Nigerians who didn't actually know uh, the imports of subsidy removal on energy products, such as um, petroleum, may have joined me on that uh, being on the edge, so to say. The issue of subsidy is one that shouldn't have been discussed in isolation of energy security. The world over, energy security is a priority of every government because it constitutes a matter of national security. And so governments all over the world deploy subsidies, general subsidies, to make energy available and affordable to their citizens. Because energy security entails affordability of energy and availability of energy. Without any of these two components, a country cannot be said to be energy secure. So, when a lot of people discuss subsidy in isolation of energy security, 
we got it wrong, and somehow an entire country was misled to now see subsidy as an anathema to economic development, whereas it is not so. In fact, it is a useful tool to develop any economy world over. And that is why, from the United States of America to Western Europe, to Middle East, to China and Southeast Asia, governments spend billions and billions of dollars to subsidize range of energy products and services for your citizens. Mm. I'm sure that, you know, I mean, we have had very, very long conversation on subsidies. And for those who have, you know, those who have also spoken about subsidies, they talk about its application and where it comes to feature. Uh, that one of the problems we have had is that we have been subsidized in consumption rather than production. And that, that's where precisely our problems have arisen from. That, that is a very flawed narrative. Nobody drinks petrol in this country. I'm not aware of anybody who eats petrol for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Petrol is a production commodity, essential one at that. Because Nigeria has a problem of epileptic power supply, and our economy largely being informal and dominated by SMEs. Petrol is the most important energy product that drives productivity in Nigeria. Yeah, but we're not looking at it in terms of the production of petrol. We're looking at the petrol as a finished product. So all we do is, you know, send our tankers out and we go and bring in this product, finished product. We're not looking at subsidizing, say, those who are trying to produce petrol in Nigeria. What, what matters to the ordinary citizen is affordable energy prices. So yes, government can reprioritize its subsidy from so-called consumption of finished products to this production. But subsidy must be a defining feature of energy security. So nobody is holding government back from redirecting spending on subsidizing sales of petroleum to its production. But whether what government likes it or not, it will spend that money, it has to spend that money to ensure energy security for citizens by subsidizing energy. We have been conditioned in Nigeria over time to see subsidy as something that was bad. And so on the eve of the 2023 election, the three leading contenders for the presidency all pledged to remove subsidy. And so essentially Nigerians were goaded to vote for subsidy removal without knowing the implication. And this is because for more than two decades, a certain economic orthodoxy has become prevalent. One that demonizes and discredits the concept of subsidy in its entirety. And this has been promoted by Washington Consensus pundits so seriously that Nigerians began to see what benefits them as something that does not benefit them. And so on the eve of election, we gave our votes. We, we voted for subsidy to be removed. And that is why I cannot entirely blame the president in principle, mm. because the removal subsidy presented was simply for fulfilled his campaign promise. Yeah, but even then, I mean, you might talk about, you know, how liberal economists perceive uh, subsidies and, you know, how there is a whole school of thoughts around that. But we know that we had a local problem with, in terms of how our own subsidies have been applied and the graft that has greeted that subsidy over the years. The fact that we're spending a a significant, hugely significant sum of money in the name of subsidizing a product which was still going to go up anyway. So uh, really, in terms of how we had applied our own subsidies, there was clearly something very wrong with that. You what was wrong you don't think so? with our subsidy administration in Nigeria was corruption. It was corruption that we needed to fight. It is the responsibility of government, in addition to providing energy security for citizens to also fight corruption and anything that will stand in its way. And we've seen that over the years, that will has not been there, so it is or that somehow will. it has consumed those who have tried to it fight it. It is that will that we need to have a conversation around. Why is that will not there? That's on one hand. Mm -hmm. And secondly, I've had arguments that we spend so much of our revenues subsidizing petrol. That is also the fault of the citizens because government is not productive enough to grow its revenue. For example, the Russian Federation, spent $30 billion to subsidize fossil fuels for citizens in 2022. Why was it able to afford it? Because Gazprom, the state-owned energy giant and the subsidiaries, were able to rake in an approximate $680 billion in revenue from both local and offshore operations. So the factor that we need to consider was productivity in government. It is the responsibility of government to be productive. Mm -hmm. We cannot 
blame subsidy for the inability of the Nigerian state to maximize and ramp up production of crude oil, for example, due to oil theft. Subsidy didn't cause oil theft. Subsidy didn't prevent government from being able to contain oil theft, for example. Now, the mismanagement in government, the whole corruption amada in government is what we need to talk about, and not subsidy. And every government since 1999 had complained about subsidy as being a factor responsible for their inability to perform. And I say that is because I think successive governments have not been able to fight corruption adequately enough and to also be productive enough to have enough revenue to take care of the welfare of citizens. And again, let me add this. There is nothing even wrong with subsidizing consumption. The United States of America spends 19% of its budget, the largest component, for social security and welfare for citizens. I know we can have this debate about subsidy and to go on and on, but what I really want to know, we've taken it out. I um, mean, Labour is currently in conversation with government to see how they can ameliorate the effects of that on at least the labour force. The question I'm asking you is, are you still on edge with the taking out of subsidy? No, of course. Subsidy has to return one way or the other. Okay. And what I would advise the government to do right now, because the effect of subsidy is going to last very long and it will be irredeemable because it's going to be like a bottomless pit. The price of energy will keep rising in Nigeria as long as there's no control or government intervention to stabilize prices, especially with the floating of the Naira, mm -hmm. which is likely to also depreciate against major currencies of the world because of low productivity. When you float a currency, I don't have a productive economy that can attract foreign exchange through competitive economic enterprise overseas. You are likely going to have scarcity of forex that will continuously drive your local currency down here. So if you combine these factors and the fact that are going to be importing petroleum products, your guess is as good as mine as yeah. to well, you're the ever-increasing prices of, of petrol, petrol at the pump. Yeah. Well, I mean, there have been um, alternatives that have also been explored, uh, compressed natural gas, CNG, uh, the fact that our ref refineries are supposed to come on, on stream. Uh, and we also have the Dangote refinery, which was commissioned just a few months ago and is expected to come on board very soon. Uh, how that is going to affect, but some people say, yeah, this is one major experiment which, which can go either exactly. way. Exactly. It's a yeah. major experiment that some of us knew will go awry. Why? That's your prediction? Yes, it's going to go because we don't have the means to intervene. If you are willing to subsidy, for example, to reinvest in the resuscitation of local refining capacity by way of fixing our four refineries mm -hmm. and probably building more, I would say, okay, well, that means we have a time frame within which government will be able to provide a buffer for energy consum consumers and users in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. But that is not really on the table as we speak. Dangote is a private refinery. Yeah, how do you know that? The Port Harcourt refinery is already being fixed as we speak. The Wari refinery, we've been, we've we understand. We've been hearing this information this, for a long time, this, this that refineries are being fixed. And for as long as I remember, refineries have been continuously being fixed and have not yet been fixed. So I'm saying, we need to see a concerted plan mm -hmm. to say, look, we're going to use savings from subsidy to resuscitate our refineries and probably build more. And but let me also say this. What I have local refineries that are private or government owned, subsidy must still come in one way or the other. But in this instance, subsidy can now come from the production side. Hmm. Again, the United States of America has what is called the strategic petroleum reserve. And what is the use of this reserve? Whenever the price of crude oil in the international market crosses the hundred dollar mark, the United States government releases products from that reserve to, cons to producers to refine at below market prices, so as to stabilize and keep prices low at the point for citizens. What am I saying in essence? Government will still have to subsidize Dangote through production incentives and any other private refinery in Nigeria because energy security, which is affordability and availability, is a core responsibility of government and has to be prioritized for the sake of our economy and welfare of citizens. So let me take you up on this issue. We heard it just like a, you know, from nowhere that this was going to happen. And we've seen the swift response on the part of Ramfak, which has said, no, this is not, at least from the spokesperson, which said this has not come from the chairman, and that this was, they must come, you know, be in a bill and, you know, be presented to the president. We've also seen the presidential spokesperson say, no such bill has been presented to the president. It must be approved by the president and nothing like that has been presented to him. But from what you know of the story and how it has gone and how it has proceeded, uh, what are your thoughts on it? Ordinarily, there, should not, there shouldn't be anything wrong 
with reviewing wages and salaries of public servants, the only public office holders, as long as they have been able to provide adequate welfare and security for citizens. If they have been doing their jobs across the board, so that they have been able to meet up with the responsibility of government in the first place, I don't think anybody will have issues, you know, remunerating them adequately. But because at the time the Nigerians are going through a lot and are being asked to sacrifice any news at all about an upward review of salary for those that are in government, will definitely raise a red flag and concerns across the across board. And that is why even the presidency has responded to say, look, this hasn't come to our notice. We will not approve any of such uh, increases. And from the fillers, it, it looks like even the Revenue Mobilization uh, Commission is taking a little bit of a, a step backwards on this matter because it is completely insensitive. However, we know that some people will be caught up in this milieu, particularly the judicial uh, officers, who for so many years, people have said, look, for people that are custodians of the judicial arm of government, they need some level of remuneration that will keep them comfortable enough to discharge their duties without fear or favor. That is a very valid point. So it's something that we need to look at and navigate out of this situation carefully. So government tells you, government don't do business. They don't do it well. So it's not a license to simply do politics and things other than governance while in government. Yeah, but you've seen our experience. All of this hasn't come out of the blues. Yes, yes. we know that a number of, in, in a number of other countries, we've seen government intervene in business yes. or even try its hand at business yes. and seem to be successful at yes. it. But our own experience has been def very different. Almost all of government-owned businesses have been run aground. Uh, and for a, a variety of reasons, I'm sure scholars must have done you know, lots of work looking at why government businesses continue to fail, particularly in Nigeria. Uh, and maybe we, we have not just reached that conclusion out of the blues that government has no business in business. Government has business in business because the only business of government is doing business. And any government that cannot do business has no business being in government. It is the Nigerian government that failed in the aspect of doing business, not government. Because governments all over the world, again, from the United States of America to Western Europe to the Middle East to China, all of these governments are fully involved in business. In fact, the countries of this part of the world are like incorporated entities, and the political leaders are like CEOs of America Incorporated, of China Incorporated, of UK Incorporated, of Japan Incorporated, of Saudi Arabia Incorporated. Are you suggesting that we need to have another conversation on exactly. what's on what our on the role ideology? Of government. We need to have well, it. What ideology we, we tend we need to, to adopt? We need to reverse this economic fallacy and adopt one that clearly puts government in the proper place to drive the economy. Contrary to the entrenched narrative that the private sector drives the economy, it is not true. It is government and its policies and its investments that drives the economy. And that was why, for example, our president stood on the negotiation grounds and made one statement, and he drove energy prices up almost in 48 hours with concomitant effect as we have seen today. That is to show you that it is government that drives the economy. So what I'm saying in a sense is this. We need to agree to adopt this philosophy once more and then reform government, rid it of corruption, mediocrity, and all forms of inadequacies that have prevented it in the past from successfully running businesses like its counterparts in other parts of the world have been doing mm -hmm. to drive revenue and grow productivity and also increase the wealth of our nation until we'll adopt this ideology, economic ideology, and move away from this neoliberal concept we've been running, Nigeria will not be out of the woods for a long time to come because we'll be chasing shadows. So we need to really question our political office holders. We need to question to, them. Yeah, as to what exactly their plans are. And, you know, you've talked about how we need to read the state. A lot of what you've said, some people say tall orders. We've been at this for quite a while. We've been at this at least in the Fourth Republic since 1999, and it does appear that things have only gone 
not as we've expected. Exactly. And it's even made us question the entire concept of democracy because of you know the fact that our right. experience since 1999 hasn't been quite what we had expected. But talking about the cost of governance, because I do recall that on Democracy Day, which was celebrated this month, uh, the president said, I feel your pain. While asking Nigerians to make many more sacrifices, you know, he said, I feel your pain. The question a lot of people were asking is, how does the president feel our pain? Is he buying petrol at this price? You know, Oh, precisely how how do you think that of public office holders can communicate to Nigerians uh, you know because everybody thinks that and large and rightly so too that not a lot has been said about the sacrifices they intend to make exactly I, I, it's a bit worrisome that uh, the new president of Nigeria President Ahmed Bolatin, who has been saying so many writings in the right places I've read some of the best speeches in recent times coming from the presidency under his leadership. But he hasn't made a firm commitment to cutting down on the cost of governance and tackling corruption holistically. Because while we're trying to cut the cost of governance, cause the cost of their own privileges, we don't want to see governors driving in fleet of convoys of SUVs. No, 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 it's no longer responsible of them to do so. We also don't want to see the same thing for the president and the ministers. We want to see a drastic shedding of excess baggages at all levels of government. However, what is most important for government to actually do is to also waive their privileges of allowing corruption to continue to thrive. I use the word privileges deliberately. That is, some people have seen government as an avenue to simply make money off political, off uh, the public treasury. So I think that the government under our president will convince us more that this sacrifice will yield fruit sooner than later. If he's able to tackle corruption, particularly procurement fraud. You see, when I talk about government doing business, until the government adopts a philosophy of business, it cannot actually tackle corruption. Because when you are business oriented, you do more with less. You, and you procure more with less. But when you have an orientation that is not business-like, we are politics rather than economics determines government policies and decisions. Government will continue to be wasteful and thrive in corruption without necessarily intending to do so. Given how these 2023 elections went, I mean, how, do you really think that those who will be coming to government who might be appointed into those positions will be thinking in that direction, will have that mindset? No, no I don't think so, because they won an election on the basis of what they believe to be true what they believe to be the best for Nigeria, they've started the implementation already. So they will be motivated to continue along the line. But some folks are saying, we've had a different opinion for as long as we can remember. And we think that we don't have to wait until Nigeria gets to economic Armageddon to begin to have a rethink. There's nothing wrong with somebody having an, a different opinion. But when you come into government, you listen to the views of Nigerians and other people and say, look, maybe we need to balance and alter our initial thinking with what we are already seen as realities on ground, so as to make Nigeria better. It is going to be a show of strength and character, and not a sign of weakness or lack of knowledge to do so. We need a new conversation about the political economy philosophy of Nigeria, and I insist, Nigeria must adopt a philosophy that mandates government to do business. Government must return to taking part in the means of production using the endowments of the 36 states of the Federation. So state governors, have a bigger role in this direction. Our governors can no longer afford to be merry-going, party-going governors who drive in fleets on crop come to Abuja every month to collect money and go back and spend it on sundry issues. The governors must go back and begin to kickstart production from the state levels by taking advantage of whatever endowments they have, whatever economic advantage they have, and use their federal allocation as seed money to invest in productivity. Nobody will do it for you. Until the government of Benin, for example, begins to invest in agro-processing facilities and industries, Benin will remain a richly endowed state in terms of agriculture with a very poor rural population, for example. Majid Hero, thank you for coming on Hard Copy. Thank you very much for having me today. Well, that's the program tonight. Do send your feedback to the handles showing on your screen. Thank you for watching. I'm Mao Kwe Okunyusef.